അതെ ഐ തിങ്ക് ദറ്റ് ഓ ദ ചേർച്ച് ഇഫ് നോ വേ ഐ സപ്പോസ് ഡു നോട്ട് ഹാവ് എനി മെറ്റർ ഫിസിക്സ് ഐ തിങ്ക് ഇറ്റ് റാ ദ ഫൺ ടു ഹാവ് മെറ്റർ ഫിസിക്സ് ഈവൻ ഇഫ് യു തിങ്ക് മെറ്റർ ഫിസിക്സ് ഇസ് മേലി ദ മേ ബി ടേക്കൻ മെറ്റർ ഫോറക്ലി റാ ദ ലിറ്ററലി ആൻഡ് ഐ മീൻ ഐ ഡോട്ട് റിയലി നോ ഈവൻ വാട്ട് ദാ ഡിസ്റ്റിങ്ഷൻ മീൻസ് റിയലി ഐ മീൻ ഇഫ് യു വാണ്ട് ടേക്ക് ഇറ്റ് ലിറ്ററലി ദാറ്റ്സ് ഫൈൻ If you want to take it metaphorically, that's fine as well. I mean, I know that sounds a bit limp <laughs> to say that, really. Um, but I, I don't know what else you can say. I don't want to cause a, a massive war within the Church of Nowhere, a massive schism uh, before, the, before the Church of Nowhere has even begun, you know, it schisms. <laughs> well, maybe that's a good thing. It schisms before it actually exists. which is interesting. Um, anyway, uh, we'll talk about the Gnostics because um, they had this metaphysics uh, that, uh, and especially the Orphic Gnostics, um, but they had this metaphysics that you have a certain thing called soul. And soul is beautiful, soul is good, soul is loving, soul is non-violent, soul is pacifist, soul... Uh, would share its last morsel with another soul. Um, although that's not actually necessary because soul is infinite and therefore knows no scarcity. Uh, and therefore there is no need to fight over scarce resources or even to share scarce resources because there aren't any scarce resources. All the resources that it has, the soul has, is in, are infinite. Uh, even supposing that it actually has any resources because Obviously, a soul is spiritual. It doesn't have resources to be scarce or otherwise. Um, so I think we better, <laughs> I better stop describing soul uh, because you know, using the words of, 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 of this consciousness that I'm in now, which is non-soul, um, I just say a lot of crazy stuff, which, you know, I might as well say that, you know, the monkey is crawling up the... the pole, basically, and that's what soul is. And I don't know. But it's this thing called soul, uh, and soul is spiritual, and soul is good. Okay, I think we can probably say that, <clears throat> whatever good means. Uh, and soul is trapped in evil matter. So this whole world uh, is evil. Uh, matter is evil. Um, it was created by an evil god, not a good god. And it makes people corrupt and evil just to be here. And uh, a lot of people said, well, how did, how did the situation arise? How did, we, how did soul become trapped uh, in this created world by, the, by this evil god? And, you know, how did it all arise? Well, there's lots of theories, basically. Um, and uh, it's, it's rather useless, in fact, to speculate, really, uh, on all this. Although a lot of Gnostic Gospels do speculate on how the situation arose. Um, and it's all pretty much gobbledygook, really. Because um, the, the important thing is that this situation is as it is. Uh, and soul is trapped in evil matter. Soul is good and the goodness, the good fire of soul is trapped in this terrible world of, of evil. Um, and, uh, you know, you have an intuitive knowledge of what evil is. And you have an intuitive knowledge of what good is. And your soul uh, damn well knows the difference between good and evil on an intuitive level. Even though intellectually I might not be able to explain the difference to you, <clears throat> I might not be able to produce much empirical evidence to show you the difference, um, and, and I might not be able to, um, uh, if I get emotional about it, uh, then that's just emotion. Uh, so I have an intu intuition which is beyond emotion, beyond philosophy, beyond thought, Uh, and beyond empirical evidence, uh, just to know that uh, this is so. Uh, anyway, this is really what the Gnostics believed. And uh, in the 12th century, uh, they were very, very well established and, and organized into the Cathars. And the Cathars, um, they believed that antinatalism was the key uh, to, to <clears throat> the situation, because basically uh, you went on strike. Uh, you said to the demiurge, to, the, to Satan, to evil, 
uh, we're not going to bring any more souls uh, into this terrible world that, that you have created, that, that you use to imprison souls with. Um, we're, not going to, we're not going to do it. Um, we're not going to have children. Now, of course, in the 12th century, um, the only way to guarantee no children was to have no sex of any, or, you know, or at least no penetrative sex, um, which, of course, was culturally probably the only kind of sex that was sort of permitted, really. Uh, I mean, when people thought of sexual intercourse, they thought, they thought of vaginal penetrative uh, sex, um, which results in children, obviously, uh, or potentially. Uh, so, uh, really, the only way was not to have sex at all. Um, I mean, you could get married, but you, you, you know, to it uh, between well, heterosexual marriage was possible, um, and but but there was no sex possible within that marriage. Uh, and of course, people say, "What about being gay?" Um, I don't know. I, I think I think the Qatars probably would have been pretty much homophobic in the sense that they would have said, a bit like the ancient Greeks, that anal penetration was not a good idea, it was a risky sexual practice, um, and that uh, gay people would be tempted into anal intercourse, or gay men would be anyway. I don't even know that they probably thought there were gay women even existent uh, in those days. Um, I mean, <laughs> Queen Victoria in the 19th century uh, she just didn't believe it when she was told about uh, gay women. Uh, she said, well, it's just not possible. You know, <laughs> you, you can't get gay women, um, which I don't know what that says about her attitude towards sexual intercourse, because she actually liked sex, by the way. Um, I mean, she loved Albert and, and they had great, they had apparently a good sex life. So, uh, but she just didn't, she could understand uh, male gayness, uh, but female gayness, nah, does not exist. Really, it doesn't. Okay, well, we'll leave that go. Um, but, uh, of course, the trouble is that, you know, people want to have sex uh, and it's very hard to sublimate or substitute or suppress sexuality um, for any length of time and effectively. Um, so, unfortunately, well, fortunately, um, the Gnostics, um, Qatars, did, did create a two-tier system uh, so there was a, there was the priesthood, uh, all the all the perfect ones, uh, and they never they didn't have any sex at all, or uh, well, they didn't get married. I mean, obviously they were priests uh, and, and curates and, and bishops, uh, and they never got married and never had sex. And then you had another tier of person that was called there was a laity, the lay people, and and they were allowed um, to get married. Um, they weren't allowed really to have much sex at all, um, but if they did and it resulted in a pregnancy, well, you know, that can't be, that couldn't be helped sort of thing, because that's, you know, you can't argue with nature, or at least you couldn't in the 12th century. Um, and if you're going to have heterosexual sex, which results in pregnancy, uh, well, that's it, you know. But of course, one, one sort of has a little bit one kind of pauses about this, really, because A, it's a two-tier system, which, which I don't agree with anyway, really. Um, and secondly, um, I mean, the, the Jains have a two-tier system in the fact that, you you know, if you're a Jain monk, you have to be very, very, very strict on, on a hymns or non-violence. But if you're a laity, you know, you don't even have to be vegetarian, necessarily. Uh, although although um, or not most most Jains are vegetarian, but you know you you could fight in a war, for example. You don't have, you don't have to be completely pacifist, for example. Um, whereas a Jain monk has to be. Um, so to go back to the Qatars, you know there was this two tier system, and of course one wonders, you know, since a lot of the nobility of of the local area uh, who were converted to Qatar uh, Gnosticism. Uh, obviously, they wanted to have children, you know, for the for the old reason of carrying on a noble line. Um, so, of course, they would have children in order to carry on uh, the the the, um, the name of the nobility that supported the Qatars. And of course, you know, obviously, money came into it then because Qatars did live in monasteries. Uh, the mon the, you know the monks lived in monasteries, and of course, they were probably financially supported uh, both by the laity and the nobility. Um, so, of course, you know, they could have children kind of thing. So there's a little bit of double standards, I feel, sort of creeping into this. Um, and it, because basically, you know, you realise that your Qatar religion will, will, of course, become extinct 
uh, if nobody has any children at all. Um, so I'm not quite sure how they the sort of justify that theologically about having children or for the laity to have children or the nobility because, you know, again, you're bringing a soul in uh, to, to be trapped in matter. Now, of course, the modern uh, Gnosticism gets round this completely uh, and, and it's no longer antinatalist because they say, oh, well, the soul comes in uh, to this evil world um, you know, but the soul kind of uh, it has to be tested and, uh, and and it has to sort of evolve as a result of coming into this terrible mess of a world. Uh, and, and so basically you can have children, you can bring souls into the world uh, because the idea of the soul is, is metamorphosis, is, you know, you come to know yourself and know God and, uh, and so it's all good in the end. So in fact, uh, the original antinatalism of the Qatars uh, has has been philosophically dealt a, a death blow really by modern modern Gnosticism and it's you know it's positive thinking and and you know the soul was, will will triumph in the end uh, so modern Gnosticism has kind of been left left behind um, and so what, where does that leave the antinatalist uh, and his and his or her uh, idea of Gnosticism or Qatars I think possibly you would have to go back. Uh, to the original Qatar uh, idea of priesthood, which is never to have sex um, and never, uh, well, not penetrative sex anyway, uh, and, and not to have children. Uh, but of course, in modern times, obviously, we have contraception uh, available. Um, we also have different ideas about sexual intimacy. Uh, we have different methods now. There's lots of different ways to skin a cat kind of thing. Um, there's lots of different methods of sexuality to create uh, orgasm or climax uh, and therefore experience the intense pleasure of sexuality uh, as well as bringing couples together in an intimate way. Um, so I suppose really uh, it, it could, and of course we also have the gay revolution uh, which, which also has this idea that you know you don't have to have penetrative sex in order to have an orgasm in order to experience sexual pleasure. So, um, so nowadays, actually, modern, I mean, Gnosticism could, could come back as a revival, actually, uh, the kind of strict orthodox, as it were, Gnosticism of the Qatars, uh, in saying that we don't actually have to have sex, uh, to order to, well, we don't have to have sex in order to create children. We don't have to create children at all. Um, you know, we don't have to bring in another soul into this torment, this torturous, to uh, terrible world. Um, we, we can actually avoid getting pregnant uh, and avoid uh, the problem of, of soul imprisonment. So in a way, we can say to the Demiurge, to Satan now, we, we can actually go back on strike. Uh, we can actually refuse to play your game. Uh, we can refuse to, to create more fetuses in the world that are going to suffer so terribly at your hands. Um, so I don't know what the devil, the devil, Demiurge and Satan are going to say to this. I'm not quite sure because in a way they're hoist on their own petard because, you know, it, it's sort of like a sexual indulgence and, and pixel sex and sex with robots and, you know, and, and gay sex and, and different kinds of sexuality uh, that heterosexuals enjoy, of course. Um, again, you, you can enjoy all these things without getting pregnant. Um, so, um, you know, the metaphysics uh, behind antinatalism could well, well be revived, actually. Um, and it doesn't have to be kind of a humanist, um, a humanist view of antinatalism. You know, you could actually have a, a burgeoning uh, metaphysical, theological, uh, even Christian uh, way of looking at antinatalism. Um, and it could be that, you know, Christianity um, becomes more antinatalist uh, as a result of this, uh, of this metaphysical revival, if you like, uh, based on Gnostic principles. And if that were true, uh, then people could have a religious basis for being antinatalist, which I think is, is quite important for some people, because some people, well, a lot of people, majority of people, actually do need a religion. They do need to believe in a God a loving intervening God uh, and they also do believe uh, that uh, you know that we are in a battle with with evil and devilry um, and that going on strike and saying we're not going to have any more children 
is a way of 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 defeating devilry and evil uh, by defeating the demiurge in this world. You know, you're not going to you're not going to play his game anymore, sort of thing. So. Um, I wouldn't rule out the fact that antinatalism could have a religious basis, um, and I think this might be a healthy basis as well, um, given the fact that we're not in the 12th century anymore. Uh, we're in modern times with, with you know, lots of modern cultural changes, uh, which could actually um, you know, provide an impetus uh, for pursuing uh, a metaphysical basis for antinatalism.